Hi everyone, this is Ryan Johnson. I'm here with my colleague Katie Douglas and today we'll be talking with you about uh, preparing a physician or dental practice for sale. Uh, before we get into the uh, webinar, a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, first, if you have a question to ask, uh, hover uh, your icon at the bottom of your computer screen and you should find an option to ask a question. Uh, feel free to type the question. Uh, we'll try to answer those time permitting at the end of today's webinar. Um, secondly, mark your calendar uh, for uh, February 8th, uh, where our colleague Bob Aronson, an immigration lawyer here at Fredrickson and Byron, will be talking about immigration issues and recruiting physicians. A bit of background before jumping into uh, the substance of the webinar. Um, physician and dental practice acquisitions continue at a pretty aggressive pace. Uh, according to a recent study, uh, hospitals and health systems are continuing to acquire practices in significant numbers. Uh, between July 2012 and July 2015, uh, health systems and hospitals acquired 31,000 physician practices, resulting in 67,000 practices being hospital owned uh, by the end of July 2015. Um, according to the author of the study, about one half of physician practices in the Midwest our health system or hospital owned, and one third of systems are uh, hospital or health system owned in the South. On top of this trend, as I'm sure most of you are uh, aware, uh, private equity groups have been very active in acquiring physician groups and dental practices across the U.S. We expect this trend to continue, and most of what we talk about today will be applicable to both uh, private equity uh, buyers as well as health system or hospital buyers. So an overview of today's webinar, uh, we're going to talk about motivations for sale. Uh, why would physician or dental practices want to uh, sell their ownership or the assets of their practice? What's the process for uh, structuring and completing a sale? How do you prepare for a sale? Uh, what types of deal structures are there? What are the regulatory issues associated with uh, physician or dental practice acquisitions? What are the business issues? And how do you execute the transaction from beginning to end. Of course, uh, we won't be able to go in depth on all of these. This is really much an overview of how these deals get put together and the considerations that need to be analyzed when doing so. Uh, let's get started, and my colleague Kay will talk about motivations for doing a deal. Okay, thank you, Ryan, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I think it'd be helpful to first start out uh, considering what motivates providers to sell their practice in the first place. Usually there are a few factors at play, uh, one of which is difficulty in recruiting new talent. Um, it's not unusual to see a situation where you have a solo practitioner or a small group of uh, physicians or dentists who are all nearing retirement and they have difficulty bringing in younger providers to continue the practice um, and also to buy out the current owners when um, it does come time for retirement. Another common motivation is the increasing difficulty in simply making money in your practice. Uh, overhead costs are um, staying the same or increasing, especially with the advent of electronic health records and state or federal mandates associated with, with implementing electronic health records. Um, and many areas of healthcare are getting crunched on reimbursement. So this combination can make it difficult to run a profitable business. <clears throat> Another motivation is healthcare reform and the uncertainty that comes with it. Uh, many providers don't want to worry about how healthcare reform is going to affect their business's bottom line and uh, will seek safety in, um, in a potential buyer um, to solve that, that problem and that uncertainty. Uh, solo practitioners or small uh, groups may have difficulty getting the required capital to make necessary improvements or expansions for their practices. Um, a hospital or other larger buyer um, may not have these same difficulties. And then, you know, finally, some sellers think that their jobs and livelihood are safer if they aren't the ones bearing all of the risk um, and feel like there's more security in having an employment agreement where someone else is um, worrying about making the payroll. Um, you know, of course, this might be a misperception, but some sellers nonetheless feel safer uh, if they can combine and join forces with a larger group or a hospital or some other uh, strategic party. 
So there are both pros and cons to selling your practice. Um, first, um, one benefit is, you know, depending on the buyer, um, your income, at least on a short-term basis, is more protected than if um, a group is out on its own. Uh, if the buyer is a well-respected hospital or other group uh, with a good reputation, a sale will help with recruitment to the practice. Uh, this will result in better uh, practice performance. Um, finally, you know, many providers want to sell their practice because they frankly just don't any longer want to worry about running the business um, and dealing with the hassles that come with owning a practice, such as um, you know, HR issues or other sort of... Um, issues that are more focused on running the business. Instead, they want to be able to practice medicine or dentistry or whatever their specialty is. So of course, uh, there are also some downsides uh, to selling your practice. First, you know, if you've been independent for a while, you may have gotten used to being your own boss and having some independence. Uh, that will change when you sell your practice. You'll be an employee with an employment agreement and duties to fulfill under that agreement. Um, for larger buyers or if you're um, combining with a larger entity, there may, there may be more red tape, if you will, in, in getting things done. Um, for example, changing uh, the supplier for certain types of supplies uh, may not be um, as easy as it used to be. It may require various sets of approvals where, you know, in the past it was a just, just a decision that you could make on your own as the owner of your practice. <clears throat> also, there's no guarantee that the transaction will be a good one or it will be successful and that everyone will be happy down the road. Uh, some providers can get frustrated when they realize that the buyer is mismanaging the business, um, but then there's no real easy way to just get things back to the way uh, it was prior to the deal. Uh, if you're dealing with a hospital, uh, you may want to uh, consider whether uh, the buyer or the hospital that's, that's buying your practice is uh, one that will be able to, um, to face the financial pressures uh, resulting in um, potential you know, declining reimbursements. Um, and whether, um, you know, if down the road that, that hospital is going to be subject to acquisition itself. Similarly, if you're dealing with a hospital or a nonprofit entity, you may now have um, a variety of federal and state regulations such as tax exemption requirements and open meeting laws that just add another layer of complexity in setting compensation um, and defining your role as a physician in, within the hospital. Okay, so we've touched on this a bit, and uh, Ryan mentioned it at the beginning, um, but there are a few different types of buyers out there, and the transaction experience will vary depending on who the buyer is. Um, so for physician groups, a common uh, acquirer is a hospital. Um, hospitals like to bring in um, physician groups into their fold to enhance continuity of care, to offer patients more comprehensive set of services, um, and to recruit talent. If a hospital wants to expand into a new line of service or specialty, it may often be easier for the hospital to buy a group that's already operating, has a reputation in the community, um, already has the physicians um, within the practice. Um, that may be easier than building um, such a uh, practice from scratch. Other uh, practices could also be potential buyers. Uh, primary reason being to expand the group's footprint geographically um, or adding a new specialty to an existing group. Another alternative is um, for an acquisition um, where the buyers are uh, physicians or dentists who are currently employed by the practice um, who want to buy out the current owners. Um, again, it's often easier to, to buy a business as a going concern rather than starting one from scratch. Uh, and finally, you know, again, as Ryan mentioned, the last several years have seen an expansion of private equity um, and other strategic buyers in the marketplace. Um, with these types of buyers, you'll likely need to structure the transaction a little differently to comply with state corporate practice um, of medicine laws or dentistry laws. Uh, and then we will we'll get into the details of those later. Okay, so moving on to the process of a typical transaction, 
Uh, while every transaction is, of course, unique, there are a few common themes um, in each deal. So before any sale, it's crucial to get your house in order, as they say. Um, if you're ready for a sale, it can mean a smoother diligence process, and more importantly, uh, potentially more purchase price up front, um, because the buyer will be more comfortable um, with um, making um, or providing the purchase price instead of um, going through the process of holdbacks uh, for indemnification or other types of um, reservations it may have. So before you even have a buyer looking into your practice, you should do some self-reflection. <clears throat> You'll then sign a confidentiality agreement um, with a potential buyer or buyers. Um, this is crucial to do before you provide any sort of information about your practice. Um, I would not sign anything without running it by your lawyer first. Um, these confidentiality agreements can vary um, in scope and complexity. Uh, sometimes they will contain exclusivity provisions that prohibit a seller from making any sort of or from having any similar discussions with other potential buyers, um, you know, or no shop provisions that um, say the same thing. Uh, your accountant should also be involved in this step, um, as one of the first items that any buyer is going to want to examine is your financials. You'll want to have a good handle on your financials before you turn them over to a potential buyer. So the next step in the process may be a letter of intent. Um, you know, it's not technically required, but uh, in the transactions I do, I would say that I um, see a letter of intent or a term sheet um, or other sort of um, indication of interest in, in almost all of the transactions. So these are typically non-binding uh, letters of intent, although they would also contain some binding provisions. Uh, the key terms of the letter of intent um, one is the anticipated purchase price. Um, there will always be language, uh, though, that, uh, that basically says that this purchase price is subject to the buyer's ongoing um, legal and financial diligence. Uh, it may contain confidentiality provisions. If you have a confidentiality agreement already in place, it may just refer back to that confidentiality agreement. Or it's possible that you're signing the letter of intent before you've provided any information, um, in which case you'll certainly want to make sure that the letter of intent uh, includes a binding confidentiality obligation um, for both parties. Um, sometimes letters of intent can get into details regarding um, certain provisions that will be contained in the definitive documentation such as indemnification provisions, whether there'll be any sort of post-closing non-compete, um, and then also uh, there will likely be some sort of exclusivity obligation that requires uh, the buyer and sometimes also, or the seller and sometimes also the buyer to, um, to not discuss um, any other potential transactions uh, with any other party during the term of the letter of intent. Again, uh, your lawyer should be involved in this step as well, uh, so you don't unwittingly sign up for something that could hurt you later. Uh, even though the letter of intent may be non-binding, it's very difficult to negotiate away from something once you've agreed to it um, at the letter of intent stage. Even if it was non-binding, it's difficult to, um, to walk or to, to back away from that. Once you have an LOI signed, the buyer will engage in a more robust diligence process. Um, again, having your house in order at this stage will help immensely. Uh, during the diligence process, you'll be negotiating the terms of the transaction documents, uh, getting required approvals. Um, the documents may have um, a period in between signing and closing where certain closing conditions must be met, such as obtaining important third party consents, like landlord consents. Um, the buyer will need to get uh, government permits and licenses in place. And then once all the closing conditions have been satisfied, um, the closing will occur. So uh, that's a very high level review of the process of a transaction. And now Ryan is going to talk about uh, the various options for structuring your transaction. All right, there are two basic structures uh, for an acquisition of a physician or dental practice. Uh, one is a stock purchase in which the buyer purchases the stock or all the equity of the practice entity. Uh, 
the other uh, primary vehicle is an asset purchase transaction in which the buyer uh, picks and uh, those assets and liabilities it wants to purchase and assume as part of the transaction. Now we're going to drive down to the pros and cons of each type of transaction and those might depend on whether you're the buyer or the seller. Uh, a key recommendation is to involve a tax advisor early in the process to get the best possible tax driven possible when structuring a deal. Uh, the decision to do a stock deal versus an asset deal may depend on the type of entity being purchased or doing the purchasing um, and other considerations. For example, um, if a buyer is a business corporation or other business entity like a private equity group and if the seller is located in one of the many states with a corporate practice of medicine prohibition, which we'll talk about in a bit, the buyer in those cases will often be prohibited from purchasing the stock or equity of the selling practice meaning that the transaction will need to be structured as an asset purchase transaction, uh, structured to comply with applicable state corporate practice of medicine or dentistry prohibitions, and we'll talk about the way those are done in a few minutes. Now, typically, buyers prefer asset transactions, um, which benefits the buyer from a tax perspective, allowing them to get a stepped-up basis in assets purchased, but it also allows them to avoid uh, acquiring unknown liabilities. In a typical asset purchase transaction, the buyer will create a list of those assets it is purchasing. It also creates a list of those liabilities it will assume as part of the transaction. Um, everything else gets left behind with the selling entity. Now in a stock transaction, again, or merger, all assets or liabilities remain with the purchase practice. So if a buyer buys the equity of a practice, um, all liabilities, known or unknown, will remain with the uh, practice that has now been acquired by the buyer. Um, and oftentimes, times buyers, of course, want to avoid unknown liabilities, uh, especially in the healthcare uh, regulatory environment, which can be quite expensive. From a tax perspective, um, if the seller is a C corporation, uh, the selling owners will be concerned about double taxation meaning that sale proceeds will be taxed once at the corporate level, the practice level, and then again when proceeds are distributed to the owners. One option with physician or dental practices that's worth examining is the concept of personal uh, goodwill. Um, so what is personal goodwill? Uh, personal goodwill is a personal asset that depends on the continued presence of a particular individual and may be attributed to the individual's, individual owner's personal skill training or reputation. Now physicians and dentists often have personal goodwill uh, based upon their relationships with patients and referral sources. Another way of looking at this is to ask what would happen if a physician or a dentist left their practice? Would the patients follow him or her? Or would they choose to remain with the practice? If the patients would follow the departing physician or dentist, well then that uh, professional has personal goodwill an asset recognized by the IRS which can be sold uh, to a buyer. Now if the uh, practice, the selling practice, has a non-compete with the physician or dentist owners, um, that practice could prevent a physician or dentist from um, leaving the practice and competing with the practice. Um, and in such circumstances, the IRS takes the position that the practice and not the individual owns the goodwill at least insofar as the scope of the, uh, the non-compete is concerned. If the uh, selling owner sells uh, personal goodwill to a buyer, uh, typically the seller will get the capital gain treatment on selling that asset. Um, if a buyer and seller want to structure a good personal goodwill transaction, um, they should do the following. Uh, there should be clear documentation of the value of the selling owner's personal goodwill, ideally supported by a third-party valuation. And there should be a separate agreement between the buyer and each selling owner for the personal goodwill. And there should be an employment agreement with each selling owner uh, with a non-compete to make sure that the buyer can capture that personal goodwill and protect against uh, competition by the selling owner. You know, another downside with asset purchase transactions is uh, this, this, the buyer uh, will have to go out and get a new tax ID number uh, look at you know contracts for assignment provisions, get third-party consents, and because of that, sometimes uh, buyer, uh, the stock purchase transaction might be uh, preferred. But note that oftentimes uh, 
even in stock purchase transactions, uh, there are third-party uh, change of control or notification provisions, meaning that uh, for certain licenses, key contracts, et cetera, uh, buyers will have to obtain uh, the consent of a third party or notify a third party uh, before being allowed to maintain or continue using uh, a license or permit or uh, existing contract. Now, the biggest downside of a stock purchase transaction, as I mentioned previously, is that all liabilities, known or unknown, remain with the practice. And so a buyer is stuck. Now, as a contractual matter, the buyer and the seller might uh, decide that the seller should be contractually responsible for certain liabilities, including unknown liabilities, and have a contractual obligation to indemnify a buyer uh, for liabilities the buyer did not intend to assume. But in the heavily regulated uh, health care environment, those indemnifications might be insufficient to make a buyer whole. Uh, the consequences for violating the anti-kickback statute, the Stark Law, the False Claims Act, uh, identification provisions might be uh, woefully inadequate uh, to make a buyer whole if there's a liability that pops up post-closing and bites the buyer. Speaking of regulatory issues, we're now going to spend a few minutes talking about some of the key regulatory issues that need to be considered when structuring a physician practice acquisition, including the anti-kickback law, the Stark Law, uh, federal antitrust laws, uh, tax exemption considerations for nonprofit tax exempt buyers. We'll talk about the corporate practice of medicine, uh, certain licensing issues, and HIPAA and privacy laws. Okay, so starting off with the anti kickback statute. Um, the anti kickback statute is a criminal statute, it's a federal law. Um, the goal of the law is to protect the Medicare program um, from overutilization and market distortions. So what does it say? Um, the main prohibition is that it is illegal to offer, solicit, make, or receive any payment intended to influence referrals under um, a federal health care program. One uh, important note is that many states will have what are known as mini anti-kickback statutes that basically expand the federal law to apply to all um, referrals or all health care services regardless of payment source. Uh, sometimes a state statute may say um, it relates to any services that are reimbursable um, by any third party payer. Um, and then sometimes it'll just say any service regardless of, of reimbursement source. In doing a uh, anti-kickback analysis, the uh, government will apply what's known as the one purpose test. Basically what this uh, test is, is um, there can be an arrangement that has uh, several legitimate purposes. But if one of those purposes, or if one additional purpose, is, the, is um, to make a payment to influence or reward referrals, then that payment um, is illegal and would violate, and the, and the arrangement would violate the anti-kickback statute. The anti-kickback statute does have a series of safe harbors that um, parties can uh, try to satisfy uh, the, the benefit of satisfying a safe harbor is that um, if an arrangement meets all of the elements, then the arrangement is free from anti-kickback scrutiny. So regardless of the party's intent, if it meets all of the elements of a safe harbor, um, then um, you're safe. There is a safe harbor for the sale of a practice. However, it's um, unlikely to apply in most um, sale transactions because one of the elements is that the physician basically be uh, no longer in a position to make any referrals to the post-closing uh, business um, after the sale. And uh, as we'll discuss later, um, in many situations, you know, uh, physicians or dentists are selling their practice, but they... Um, likely will not retire immediately. So uh, luckily, failure to meet a safe harbor is not fatal. Um, if you fail to meet a safe harbor, then uh, you would be subject to uh, the one purpose test. So if um, any sort of government regulator were to examine um, 
the transaction, they would use the one purpose test to determine whether or not um, you had any, um, any purpose or intent to uh, reward or influence referrals. Okay, so uh, we have a nice little uh, acronym here, get your house in order. Um, how do you uh, get your house in order with respect to the anti-kickback statute? First, uh, just know that all buyers are going to be focused on, um, on this and will want to feel comfortable with uh, your practices um, anti-kickback compliance. If a buyer is not comfortable um, after doing diligence, the buyer may reduce the purchase price, um, may ask for specific indemnification, um, may not provide as much purchase price uh, money up front, and may instead have it um, be escrowed to deal with potential liabilities arising from noncompliance. So uh, failure to, um, to show good compliance with the anti-kickback statute uh, can have real consequences in a sale transaction. So what can you do? Uh, first, review all of your arrangements, uh, both written and oral, uh, with referral sources. And if you can satisfy any of the safe harbors um, um, applicable to those arrangements, such as um, you know, a real estate lease or other types of service agreements, then that would be ideal uh, because it would remove any sort of question about noncompliance with the anti-kickback statute. You should also review uh, your practice's current policies relating to um, relationships with referral sources um, and also um, just general um, conduct in connection with providing any sort of or receiving any sort of um, a kickbacks. Um, for example, how does your group handle discounts? Um, do you engage in the regular waiver of copays? What sort of analysis goes into um, whether you're going to um, waive a copay or um, write off charges for certain patients? I would uh, definitely advise engaging your lawyers in this process uh, since they will know what buyers will be looking for. Um, you know, also we're, we're talking about getting your house in order in connection with a sale, but this is a good idea even if you aren't planning on going through a sale transaction because um, it's just general uh, good practice to make sure that you have policies in place um, to, um, to ensure compliance with the anti-kickback statute. Uh, the anti-kickback statute can also affect how a transaction is structured. Um, for example, um, whether or not your, um, your purchase price may contain some sort of earnout component. Um, you know, it, an earnout could be tied to the performance of the practice um, for some sort of period following the closing. Um, buyers may like this because they, um, they have a little bit uh, more certainty in, in what they are paying for and they aren't um, putting as much money at risk um, if they're, as they would if they were um, giving 100% of the purchase price up front. So while they can you know, be a very legitimate way to value a practice, um, if the goal of the earnout is to get the seller to refer business back to the buyer after the closing, um, then that could create issues under the anti-kickback statute. Um, I have had um, questions before about, well, what if we just carve out any sort of Medicare or Medicaid business, um, then we're fine, right? Well, maybe not. Um, you need to examine whether or not your state has a mini and a kickback statute, because if it does, then simply carving out Medicare or Medicaid business um, would not um, get you free from any sort of uh, regulatory scrutiny. Uh, compensation arrangements following the closing will also need to be tailored to comply with the anti-kickback statute um, such that any compensation running back to the seller physicians um, or dentists or fair market value um, for the services being provided um, and that the compensation doesn't include you know additional compensation for the seller's referral activities. So um, uh, Companion of the uh, anti-kickback statute, um, they're often in the same conversation, is uh, the federal Stark Law. So unlike the anti-kickback statute, Stark is a civil statute. Um, it's a strict liability statute. If you do not um, meet one of the many exceptions to Stark, then it is an automatic violation. Um, but the, the good news is that Stark does not always apply. It isn't quite... Um, as common to run into um, as a anti-kickback statute. 
So the first thing to do in analysis is determine whether it applies, uh, whether Stark applies to the transaction. Uh, in general, Stark will apply to a sale transaction if there's a referral relationship of designated health services um, between the selling physician and um, the buyer. So if it does apply, um, you need to satisfy an exception. There is an exception um, for isolated transactions, and that is the one that's most applicable um, to the actual sale transaction, to the compensation that's going to be um, the, basically the purchase price. Um, it has many requirements. Um, first is that the purchase price be fair market value. It cannot be based on the volume of value of referrals or other business um, between the, um, or from the physician uh, back to the buyer. The agreement has to be commercially reasonable such that, you know, it would be commercially reasonable for these two parties to enter into this arrangement um, even if there were no referral relationship uh, between the two entities. And then you can't have any additional transactions between the two parties for six months um, following the closing unless an exception applies. So for example, if there's an employment arrangement, um, then as long as um, the, that employment agreement satisfies the exception applicable to um, employment agreements under Stark, um, then that would be okay. So um, Stark also only applies when you have the referral of designated health services. Um, designated health services, it's, it's a defined term within Stark and there are 11 categories subject um, to this definition. So um, a few of them, clinical lab services, physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech language pathology services, imaging services, um, DME, uh, prosthetics and orthotics, home health services, um, outpatient prescription drugs, and inpatient and outpatient hospital services are some of the um, more common DHS that you're going to run into. So whenever you've got um, a buyer where there's a referral relationship between the buyer and the seller, you'll want to make sure um, um, that uh, you'll, you'll want to go through the Stark analysis to see whether the transaction needs to be structured in a way to satisfy that exception. So again, this is going to be a hot button issue in diligence. Um, as with the anti-kickback statute review, you'll want to make sure um, all of your agreements with referral sources um, involving um, designated health services, you want to make sure that um, all of those agreements satisfy um, exceptions. Now this is unlike the anti-kickback statute where it'd be nice to um, satisfy a safe harbor. If you've got um, an arrangement to which Stark applies, you need to have an exception um, satisfied. You'll also want to review uh, state law to determine whether there's any sort of state version of the uh, federal Stark law. Um, state versions can um, apply to different types of services. Um, often it might be a more a, a narrower set of services um, and certain providers. Um, and the exceptions can be different. So um, you can't uh, just um, stop at a review of the federal law. You need to make sure that there are no state laws at play. Uh, one place that physician groups will get tripped up um, with respect to Stark is in their compensation formula. Uh, it's very important that your compensation formula be structured in a way that complies with Stark. Um, there are very specific rules on when physicians can be paid based on uh, production and, and when you can share in um, any sort of profits generated from ancillary services. Uh, again, discuss this with your lawyer to confirm that your current compensation formula complies with Stark. And also, you know, as with the uh, getting your house in order for the anti-kickback statute, you should be complying uh, with this anyway. So I think it's always a good idea to kind of revisit and make sure that you're still fully compliant. Uh, Stark may also affect the structure of your transaction if, um, if, if it does apply. Um, if Stark applies such that you need to satisfy the isolated transaction exception, then an earnout will not work uh, because the payment um, going to the referring physician cannot vary based on the volume or value of referrals. So um, know that if Stark applies that um, you know earnouts won't be doable in that situation. And then similarly, compensation arrangements post-closing will need to be structured in a way uh, to satisfy a Stark exception. All right, antitrust. 
Uh, healthcare transactions involving competitors uh, or with anti-competitive implications uh, need to be structured uh, to ensure they do not violate state or federal antitrust laws. Now, there are several federal and state antitrust laws to considering when structuring uh, any acquisition, uh, but today we're going to focus on the Clayton Act, uh, Section 7 specifically, which prohibits mergers in any line of commerce or in any activity affecting commerce in any section of the country. The effect of such acqu acquisition may be, which may be to substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. Uh, so the primary concern for the Clayton Act is uh, ensuring that markets remain competitive, uh, especially following a merger or other acquisition. According to the Supreme Court, the key question is whether following a transaction, the buyer or surviving entity will be able to raise prices above those that would be charged in a competitive market. Um, answering this question requires examining the market share of both buyer and seller, uh, pre-closing and post-closing. Uh, the geographic market, uh, the relevant geographic market is probably the single most important issue in healthcare merger cases or acquisition cases. Um, you know, the plaintiff would like to define a market narrowly, thereby increasing the concentration um, of, a, of a deal in the market and increasing the likelihood that it violates the applicable antitrust law. The defendant, uh, the surviving entity or a buyer, would like to defend the market broadly uh, to ensure there's plenty of competition in the market, thereby lessening the impact of any acquisition or merger. Now, the Supreme Court has indicated that the relevant geographic market uh, in doing an antitrust analysis um, should include the area in which sellers compete and to which the purchaser uh, of items um, or services can reasonably practically turn for alternative suppliers. So in healthcare, um, the question is, where would patients travel to seek a particular product or service? Uh, in healthcare, uh, patients will often travel further to be seen by a specialist than they would for primary care or dental services. Or in other words, uh, the geographic market uh, for specialty services is often broadly much larger than it is for uh, primary care uh, practices. Uh, in some recent cases, uh, courts have found that patients are willing to travel more than 60 miles for cardiac services, 120 miles for cardiology services, uh, but only 36 miles uh, for primary care. When doing an antitrust analysis, uh, another key component is what are the applicable services? So uh, what services will be affected as a result of an acquisition or a merger? So for example, uh, if, a, if a hospital is buying a physician group and there's a cardiology group, uh, how will the acquisition or merger affect the concentration of cardiology service in the market? Will the hospital now have a higher concentration or ownership of cardiology services in a market? Um, and what will be the likely uh, effect on pricing as a result of this concentration? In doing this analysis, the federal government often applies a tool known as the herfindahl hirschman Index, uh, which we won't go into in depth now. Uh, but basically the government uses the tool to determine the pre- and post-closing uh, concentrations in a particular uh, area um, for specialty services or primary care services <clears throat> to help determine the impact on competition. You know, other kind of key questions in, in terms of the analysis uh, from the antitrust perspective, uh, if prices increase uh, post-closing, uh, given increased market concentration, Will other providers or other competitors be able to enter the market in a timely way? Uh, if so, uh, there might be an ease of entry defense uh, for the buyer or surviving entity. Uh, the ease of entry defense means it's easy for cheaper, more efficient, or higher quality competitors uh, to enter a market, thus minimizing the anti-competitive dangers and impact associated with market concentration or power. Another key part of analysis is whether the acquisition uh, will result in any efficiencies in the market that ultimately benefit consumers. Another consideration is if uh, a buyer or the seller is on the brink of failure. If a physician practice or dental practice looks like it might go belly up, it's about to fail. Um, that's relevant in the antitrust analysis. The regulators might determine that that failure might have a more harmful impact uh, on the market and for consumers or patients. Um, than allowing a, an acquisition or merger to occur uh, 
which results in higher concentration or perhaps monopoly power in a given market. So a question that uh, is often asked is, uh, if we understand the law, so how do we get caught? Uh, is, there, is there great risk here? So, you know, mergers or acquisitions will get the attention of state or federal antitrust regulators in a variety of ways. Uh, one is governmental filings. If a transaction is structured as a merger um, and you have to file articles of merger with the Secretary of State, uh, that could get the attention of the, of the government. Um, if you have to notify a professional licensing board of an acquisition, a change of control, or a new entity, uh, that might again, bring attention to the transaction which might result in an antitrust enforcement action. Uh, payers. Uh, payers uh, don't like acquisitions or mergers that result in higher concentration, a particular service area, more leverage uh, for a provider, which results in uh, higher prices. So payers sometimes complain about acquisitions or mergers. Sometimes competitors complain. Uh, they don't like it to be a bigger, uh, stronger competitor in the neighborhood and they might call their state or federal officials to uh, ask them to investigate and look at a, an acquisition or a merger. Um, also, media attention. Um, oftentimes, there's a press release following an acquisition or a transaction. You know, um, someone might uh, read about that, have concerns, and that might uh, kick off an investigation uh, following an acquisition or merger. Um, so again, what defenses are available? Um, Efficiencies, if the transaction will ultimately result in greater efficiencies for the market, which will benefit consumers and buyers, that's a great uh, defense under uh, the Clayton Act, Section 7. Um, ease of entry, when you have dental practices, physician practices, one defense is that even if there is uh, you know, high levels of concentration in a market, and even if that concentration results in higher prices for some period of time for consumers or payers, if competitors can easily enter the marketplace and compete, uh, thereby, in theory, lowering prices again or improving quality, um, the antitrust concerns aren't as high. Uh, sometimes uh, the ease of entry um, is supported by you know, a sponsor in the market. A hospital might say we can't uh, compete efficiently. Um, there's concentration here by one specialty group, and so they will recruit their own physicians, bring competitors into the market. Uh, that can also be a positive point in an antitrust analysis. Um, so what if there's a problem? If the government looks at an acquisition and there's a problem, they think there's an antitrust problem under the Clayton Act or otherwise, um, the government could order um, the buyer to divest itself of the acquired practice, the acquired business, or, or, some, uh, or some similar sort of spin-off transaction. It could result in an order to cease and desist from future acquisitions. So the hospital or other buyer might be prevented from expanding beyond its current footprint based upon a violation. It might result in rate or referral regulation at the state level, and we've seen that a couple of times. Uh, potentially there are also damages, triple damages available for violations of Section 7 of the, of the Clayton Act. Some practical advice uh, if you're putting together an acquisition which might result in high levels of concentration. Uh, don't be greedy. Uh, don't, when you're negotiating with payers, don't be greedy or dealing with, you know, patients or other consumers. That can trigger a complaint, which can lead to an investigation. Don't brag. Um, you know, if following an acquisition buyer or the acquired, brag about how much more leverage they have in the marketplace against consumers or other buyers or patients. That can, again, result in a complaint. And that doesn't look good in, uh, as Exhibit A in an enforcement action. Um, you can also seek guidance from a relevant agency. So if you're working with counsel, you can ask, you know, the federal or state regulators, what do you think about the proposed transaction? Um, typically, you're required to submit, you know, su substantial data so that it'll ultimately be good for the market or it won't result in unacceptable market concentration. But you can always seek guidance uh, from the state or federal agencies. Uh, another uh, important point is that this is not just a pre-acquisition concern or immediate post-closing concern. Uh, there's no statute of limitations for enforcement of some of these antitrust laws. Uh, two recent examples in Evanston, an investigation began two years after a merger, and the final FTC decision did not come until eight years after the merger. Um, also, urology of central Pennsylvania, an antitrust case, an investigation against her two years after the merger, and it, the issue was not resolved until six years after the merger. So, unfortunately, the antitrust risk can continue long after a deal closes. Uh, moving on to tax exemption.
Uh, if you have a tax-exempt buyer like a health system or a hospital, the deal has to be structured to um, comply with uh, the tax-exempt rules and regulations. Uh, the central purpose for a tax-exempt entity must be uh, its charitable activities. In particular, according to the rules and regulations, no part of the organization's net earnings may near to the benefit of any private individual or shareholder. If a tax-exempt entity is buying a physician practice or dental practice, that entity will want to structure the purchase price to the purchase to protect its tax-exempt status. And this is relatively easy to do, but it's important to do it the right way. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, quickly, a couple high-level um, rules that apply to tax-exempt organizations. There can be no private benefit. Um, a 501c3 organization cannot engage in activities that benefit private interests, for example, selling owners or selling practice, unless that private benefit is incidental. Uh, this applies to individuals inside a tax-exempt organization as well as outside. Importantly, this is a key takeaway, payment of fair market value for assets in a practice acquisition or payment of fair market value compensation is not a prohibited private benefit. There can be no private inurement. Um, this concerns the physician's relationship with the tax-exempt health system or hospital and whether there is control or influence over the activity by virtue of being an insider. Uh, for example, of a physician employed by a seller is also on the medical staff of the buying uh, hospital or health system and is involved in making a decision on whether the nonprofit should purchase the practice and for how much, well, that could raise private inurement issues. However, again, payment of fair market value for assets should not constitute inurement. So what is fair market value? Uh, you know, this concept comes up for the anti-kickback statute, the Stark Law, many other health care uh, rules and regulations. Generally speaking, uh, fair market value is the price on which a willing buyer and a willing seller would agree, neither being under the, any compulsion to buy or sell, and both having reasonable knowledge of the relevant facts. Um, again, there's some nuances under various uh, federal health care regulatory laws. Um, it's important to ensure that the transaction is structured with, uh, to be a fair market value transaction. Uh, you know, my recommendation is to obtain a third-party appraisal to substantiate and document the fair market value determination and it, uh, um, ensure that uh, the, any goodwill that's purchased from a practice is retained by the buying nonprofit health center hospital um, via employment agreement or independent contractor agreement. Um, if tax-exempt bonds are involved, uh, which is often the case with tax-exempt buyers, ensure experienced uh, you know, bond counsel to make sure that the transaction won't create creation of the bonds, and make sure that there's thorough board documentation that they've evaluated that and determined that the overall transaction is uh, reasonable in the nonprofit's best interests and structured so that um, all financial components are consistent with fair market value. And with that, we'll turn to HIPAA. Okay. Uh, well, so here's a question I get a lot um, when advising sellers uh, in a transaction is, do we need a business associate agreement for disclosures of protected health information in connection with diligence? Um, there are um, a lot of times when, um, when buyers or sellers will, will say that one is required. However, uh, the answer is no, you do not need a business associate agreement in connection um, with disclosures of PHI for diligence purposes. Um, covered entities uh, under HIPAA may use and disclose protected health information for treatment um, purposes and, for, and, and also for healthcare operations purposes. So one of the, um, within the definition of healthcare operations um, is the sale, transfer, merger, or consolidation of all or part of the covered entity with another covered entity or an entity that following uh, the transaction will be a covered entity and the due diligence related to that transaction. So um, the short answer is that you can disclose PHI in connection with diligence. However, uh, this doesn't mean that you can or should be reckless with um, what is disclosed. I would uh, advise that you only disclose protected health information to the extent it's necessary and relevant to the review, um, that you are aware of who it is being disclosed to and making sure that it gets into um, the hands of those who are going to be performing the review and who um, actually 
are the ones who need to know um, about the information. Many times transactions will have a uh, data room um, uh, where uh, buy or where sellers will upload diligence items. Um, I would be very careful to make sure that the data room is a um, data room with a reputation for being secure and that um, any information that you put on um, that site um, is protected from being hacked. Um, keep in mind that there's also state law versions of HIPAA that may have tighter restrictions on when it is appropriate or permissible to disclose protected health information. Um, you know, at a minimum, I like to include language in the confidentiality agreement or confidentiality provisions of, L of letters of intent that specifically call out the party's um, intent to keep any uh, PHI confidential and to only use or disclose it for the minimum necessary purposes to conduct the diligence. So how do you get your house in order for a HIPAA review in the diligence process? Um, I uh, recently did a transaction where uh, I was representing a buyer and in the diligence request uh, where we had asked about um, HIPAA policies and procedures and other documents related to HIPAA compliance, the seller simply responded, uh, we suck at HIPAA. Um, <laughs> and while that honesty was appreciated, um, I uh, would hope that uh, no uh, sellers uh, would have to be put in that position of having to say that you suck at HIPAA. So uh, what can you do um, uh, to make sure you don't have to make that type of disclosure? Uh, first, make sure that your policies and procedures are up to date. Um, make sure that your employees have been trained on the current uh, HIPAA policies and that you have a process in place for regular employee training and documentation of that training. Um, if you haven't done one recently, conduct a security risk assessment under the security rule. Um, OCR has an online tool that's designed to have covered entities conduct the assessment themselves and they attempt to make it rather user friendly. Um, you could also engage a uh, consultant or other third party to do the security risk assessment for your practice. Uh, whichever route you take, whether you do it yourself or you engage a third party to do so, um, you know, a key um, component is actually implementing the suggested action items wherever deficiencies have been found. Um, you know, getting a risk assessment done will do you no good in a diligence review if the buyer then asks, you know, whether you have done anything in response to that security uh, risk assessment. Um, be prepared to disclose to the buyer any breaches of protected health information. Um, under HIPAA and explain how the breaches were handled. Hopefully they were um, handled in the uh, in a way that was compliant with HIPAA and reported to the extent necessary or in the appropriate manner. Uh, you should have business associate agreements in place with all of your business associates. Um, those agreements should be up to date and reflect uh, the most recent uh, changes uh, to HIPAA um, that were enacted a couple of years ago. All right, the corporate practice of medicine prohibition. We've referred to that a couple of times uh, earlier in this webinar. Uh, the corporate practice of medicine prohibition prohibits <clears throat> uh, for-profit or business corporations from employing physicians um, or dentists or from owning or controlling uh, the clinical aspects of physician or dental practices. Now, a majority of states in the U.S. have a corporate practice prohibition uh, but the specifics of the prohibition depend on the state you're in. Some have very strong prohibitions. Um, others are a bit uh, weaker. Now, the doctrine was first introduced at the beginning of the 20th century by the AMA in an effort to, uh, for doctors to gain better control over the medical profession and prevent the commercialization of the profes uh, profession through the introduction of profit-making incentives. Uh, the prohibition was also designed to prevent quackery. Again, now most states have a prohibition on the corporate practice of medicine um, uh, and dentistry. Um, but again, uh, the specifics depend on the state that you're in. So what does this mean? So if you have a uh, private equity buyer uh, looking at a dental practice or a physician practice, if you have a business corporation as the buyer, um, in a state that prohibits the corporate practice of medicine or dentistry, uh, you'll have to structure the transaction to comply with applicable state law. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that typically means that the buyer can't purchase the equity of the selling practice because unlicensed owners can't own 
um, a, pr a practice uh, based upon the state corporate practice prohibition. In those situations, uh, the transaction will have to be structured, I'll mention in a, in a couple of slides, but first, why do we care? Why would a buyer or seller care? Because there are potential, you know, pretty serious ramifications for violating state corporate practice prohibitions. One, there could be an injunction against the continued operation of the practice. Uh, there could be criminal prosecution for engaging in the unauthorized practice of medicine, and that would apply to the, the buyer, the scenario I just described. Um, there could also be criminal prosecution of the selling physicians or dentists for aiding and abetting um, the buyer in engaging in the unauthorized practice of medicine. The entire range between buyer and seller could be declared void, including you know, related employment agreements, um, licensing agreements, and that's something obviously buyers and sellers would uh, want to avoid. Um, some payers, if you look at the case law across the U.S., will refuse to pay claims based upon corporate practice um, violations. And if, he, if a practice has um, a private practice exception to some state licensing requirement um, or physician or dental office exception to a state licensing requirement, that might be uh, forfeited if a state finds that uh, uh, the, the structure violates state corporate practice of medicine or dentistry prohibitions. Of course, with the licensed professionals, the state licensing board uh, could seek to discipline the participating physicians or dentists, uh, uh, again, based upon corporate practice prohibitions. Now, there is a pretty typical way that you know, business corporations structure deals uh, when they're acquiring physician or dental practices uh, to avoid running afoul of uh, state corporate practice prohibitions. And that's the management company structure. Um, in this structure, uh, the management company would purchase all of the clinical, uh, non-clinical assets of the seller. Tables, chairs, computers, takeover leases, um, hire administrative staff, but all of the professionals, those who treat patients, diagnose and treat patients, would remain employed by a professional corporation, which would be owned by appropriately licensed professional owners. So the management company would enter a long-term management agreement with the professional corporation and provide all non-clinical services, thereby allowing the professionals to practice medicine or dentistry without thinking about all the administrative services that are being provided by the management company you know, advertising support, billing, coding, um, negotiating leases with landlords. Everything administrative takes place over at the management company side. Everything clinical is on the professional corporation side. Now, how these are structured, again, depends on the specifics of state law. It's a pretty typical model, um, and it's one that you want to work through with legal counsel who understands the nuances of state corporate practice prohibitions and how to structure these, again, to comply with state state law. Skip ahead a few slides. Um, risk with the structure, um, you know, there are cases where the owners, if you go back to the professional corporation, you have to have licensed professionals owning the PC, which enters into a management agreement with the management company. The owners might seek to void the agreement, um, either because they want a bigger piece of the pie if the whole enterprise is successful, or the owners have some falling out with the management company. Uh, it's important to understand that risk and uh, structure the arrangement to bake in protections to protect the management company from that sort of scenario. Uh, the other risk is that the whole arrangement might be viewed as a sham. You know, if an attorney general or a licensing board or some plaintiff or a payer uh, complains, uh, they might allege the entire arrangement is a sham. Now that said, these risks are pretty common across the U.S. in states with corporate practice prohibitions, um, and for the most part, they have been upheld. With that, Katie, ownership and governance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you should also have your house in order when it comes to your corporate records. Uh, stock records are going to be more important in a stock transaction than an asset transaction where the buyer will be um, um, purchasing all of the stock of the organization. But um, it's nonetheless um, you know, important in either um, structure. Uh, buyers are going to want to see that all current shareholders have been appropriately issued stock and that all former shareholders have been appropriately bought out and their stock has been uh, relinquished. Also, uh, consider what corporate approvals or shareholder, shareholder approvals will be required in connection with the transaction. Um, you know, I've seen it a few times where a subset of a practice will get relatively far down the road in negotiations, spending time and money in discussions with the buyer. Uh, only to have the deal then, you know, not approved by the larger group. Um, 
or uh, they're unaware that the larger group has to approve the transaction. So this is obviously a, you know, a delicate balance uh, for confidentiality reasons um, and just efficiencies. You don't want to alert everyone and have everybody involved um, in the negotiations of a potential sale, but you also don't want to wait too long um, to know whether the deal will go through or to be surprised by uh, corporate approvals that may be required. Uh, you also want to make sure that you have all appropriate licenses in hand, that none have expired, or if they have expired, that renewals have been applied for. Uh, buyers will be focused on this aspect. Um, also consider whether any licenses you hold are transferable or whether there are any significant hoops to jump through for a buyer to run the business post-closing. Uh, for example, you know, some types of providers may require certificates of need to operate, um, and that certificate of need process can be quite lengthy in certain states. Um, you know, and this isn't something that uh, you as a seller would, would need to prepare for, but it's more kind of expectation setting um, that if there is going to be some long lead time that you are aware um, and prepared for that. Um, we also talked about this a little earlier, but it's important to get a good handle on your financial statements in anticipation of a sale. Um, this is important for a few reasons. If you are armed with more knowledge about the financial performance of your practice, you'll be in a better position to negotiate purchase price. Um, you don't want to simply be in a reactive mode. Uh, buyers will also be more comfortable um, with the negotiations uh, if it looks like you have kept your house in order in this respect. Um, you know, for example, have you simply been preparing your financials internally or have you engaged outside uh, accountant um, to review or even audit them? So most sale transactions result in the selling providers remaining on board for at least some period of time as an employee or contractor um, of the buyer post-closing. Um, you know, in most practices, the real value is in the human capital, so buyers are going to be very focused on what the post-employment um, or the post-closing employment arrangements look like um, because they want to make the most out of their investment. Um, you know, it, it isn't unusual to have a physician group sell where not 100% of the physician groups or if it's a dental group where not all of the providers are, um, are keen on the transaction. Um, you know, a buyer's biggest fear would be paying for a practice uh, but then immediately losing all the talent. So for this reason, you'll often see closing conditions that require at least some percentage of the providers to sign up with the buyer post-closing. So it's important to, um, to recognize that and to be prepared for that, um, that if you, there is going to be or if there are going to be some disgruntled uh, physicians or dentists on the sell side that uh, you prepare for that um, and how that could affect the transaction. So negotiation of the post-closing employment agreements is an important part of the process, uh, especially if the providers will be signing agreements that look very different from their current agreements. Um, you know, the important thing to keep in mind is that if you want the buyer to commit to something in connection with uh, your employment arrangement, make sure it's in writing um, and that it can't be changed without uh, the provider's consent. The buyer uh, may require a non-compete in the employment agreement. Um, this is important to identify sooner rather than later so that expectations can be set. Um, you know, it's especially important if current employment agreements don't contain non-competes and uh, physicians or dentists will be asked to sign non-competes post-closing. Um, that can be a difficult conversation to have and it can be difficult to get sellers on board with that um, if they, you know, if it's inconsistent with what they're used to. You know, an employment of support staff post-closing is another important issue to consider. Um, you know, buyers will vary on whether they need to keep all support staff on board. They may be able to consolidate some back office functions with their current staff. Um, and as a seller, this, you should consider whether this is important to you. If it is important, uh, bring it up sooner rather than later um, with the buyer in the transaction, again, for expectation setting. Separate and aside from employment agreements is the restrictive covenant that a buyer may request and will most likely request in connection um, or under the purchase agreement. Um, these uh, non-competes or restrictive covenants are often a little longer in term than uh, what you are used to seeing in connection with an employment agreement. Um, it can be up to five years. Sometimes the geographic scope is greater than uh, what would be um, contained in an employment agreement in connection with an employment non-compete. Um, so it's important to be aware of this um, distinction. 
you'll often find a non-compete in both the purchase agreement where the owners of the practice are agreeing to that and then there will also be a non-compete in the employment agreement where uh, the owners and then maybe other non-owner physicians or dentists may um, be required to um, to sign up for those all right so we've gone past the uh, official end times so I'm going to skip ahead to due diligence mm -hmm. um, so what's this process all about so due diligence is primarily conducted by the buyer uh, to identify problems or risks uh, that might arise out of the transaction or that other might, otherwise might affect the purchase price now sellers might also want to request some information from the buyer uh, for example if a seller seller owners expect to be employed by the buyer after the transaction they'll want to know what the employment arrangement might look like how compensation is structured etc um, as early in a transaction as possible uh, the buyer should send the seller a checklist of due diligence items that it wants to review both legal and financial um, and the sellers of course should disclose all relevant items even if they're less than desirable uh, to avoid any later claims for breach of covenant or misrepresentation or warranty now a couple of things to look at in due diligence contracts of course um, now in a merger contracts may automatically transfer by operation of law or change of control but you need to review them to confirm that's the case um, in an asset purchase transaction uh, contracts typically need the other party's consent for assignment to the buyer now the failure to obtain required consents can result in the loss of contractual rights the acceleration of monetary obligations or potentially an action for breach of contract for example in the healthcare space if a payer contract is assigned without appropriate consent and the buyer submits claims and receives reimbursement uh, the payer could subsequently learn of the assignment and require repayment of all amounts um, paid by the payer uh, note that if you assume a payer contract as part of a transaction you oftentimes also assume liabilities under that contract for pre-closing billing activities a quick comment about um, payer agreements and uh, and due diligence this relates to antitrust you know if the buyer and sellers are competitors uh, sharing specific information during due diligence regarding payment rates or charges under payment agree payer agreements uh, can result in a, a violation of payer contract terms like confidentiality and also have legal implications relevant to antitrust and price fixing if the deal does not close uh, to minimize or avoid this risk uh, many parties limit disclosure of this type of information until a deal is sufficiently mature um, oftentimes after signing a letter of intent um, sometimes later in the due diligence process after the deal is again uh, more likely to to close um, some parties will actually engage an independent third party uh, to conduct an assessment of the financial implications of the merger or acquisition uh, and thus creating a firewall to ensure that rate or pricing information is not shared between buyer or seller again until uh, after a deal closes or uh, after the deal is sufficiently mature if a third party is engaged uh, the financial implications uh, on the buyer and seller is typically assessed in the aggregate form and shared in the aggregate form so again the buyer and seller don't have access to specific information about specific payers um, license and permits uh, of course buyers need to make sure that a sellers have all required licenses and permits to operate the business and then make sure that they have uh, those licenses and permits post closing so they can continue to operate the business um, you know what sort of approvals or consents or notifications are required obviously depends on the specific license or permit and whether the deal is structured as an asset transaction or a stock transaction uh, for health care entities you'll of course want to look closely at the, the practice the selling practices business relationships uh, including referral relationships for all the reasons KD discussed under the anti-kickback statute under the Stark law etc you want to look at compliance with HIPAA policies uh, or HIPAA and make sure you have appropriate policy in place and you have business associate agreements with all business associates you will also want to look at undocumented arrangements and uh, see what sort of regulatory concerns or business concerns those undocumented arrangements might present to a buyer there's of course much more to look at in doing due diligence um, you know financial statements leases need for landlord consent etc but a high level are some of the more important things to look at when acquiring a physician or dental practice um, quickly you need approval uh, from often the owners and the board uh, to enter a stock or asset purchase transaction 
You have to execute new employment agreements for any owners, dentists, or physicians who continue with the buyer post closing. Again, high level engage a counsel, engage legal counsel. Um, put the agreement between buyer and seller in writing, um, covering everything that's important to the deal. If the promise or the uh, uh, doesn't exist in writing. Uh, in the agreement, it's, you're going to be in a much uh, worse place when trying to enforce your rights or defend yourself. Also, not having something in writing can create certain regulatory uh, issues under some of the laws we've talked about today. Um, we're going to wrap up there. I think we've run past our time. If you do have questions or comments, please email them to Katie or me, and we'll try to follow up after um, we wrap today. Thank you. Thank you.